But we are here today to attend the talk by Professor Lali Beja. So I will give the floor now to Professor Ginzel to uh, present um, Lali, that is a great research on EDA uh, based in Calgary, Canada. So, Ginzel, the floor is with you. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Ricardo, for introducing me and for the so many important and interesting announcements. So today, uh, it's my honor and my pleasure to introduce you Dr. Lali Beja, who will give us the talk entitled Application of Physical Design Algorithms in Other Domains. Dr. Lali Beja is a professor at the Department of Electrical and Software Engineering at the University of Calgary, Canada. Her research focuses on developing mathematical techniques and software tools for automating the design of digital integrated circuits and on developing to, cheat, to teach innovation and creativity in post-secondary education. She is an advocate for underrepresented groups in science and engineering and works on removing systems barriers that exist in their advancement. So thank you, Dr. Veja, for accepting our invitation and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, both Ricardo and Jose. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna quickly talk today about the applications of physical design in other domains. Um, I also have an alternative title for my presentation. Um, let's see if I can move this forward, yeah. Which is our, our feet are held to the fire, so we need to do something about this. And the picture you see here was a picture about a month ago from uh, a little bit north of where I live, where the forest fires basically destroyed the whole community. Um, but before I start, I would like to mention that and acknowledge that I live, uh, work and play on the traditional territories of the Treaty 7 people of Canada, uh, which are located, which is located in the southern, um, southern Alberta. Uh, and this, uh, these nations include the Blackfoot Confederacy comprised of Siksika, the Pikani, the Ghanai First Nation, the Sutina First Nation, the Stony Nakoda, including Chiniki, Perispa, and Good Stony, as well as the Métis Nation Region 3. The indigenous people of Canada have been calling this land uh, this uh, land their home for thousands of years, and we acknowledge that we live as settlers on their land. Uh, so as uh, Ginzo mentioned, I am a professor in electrical and software engineering. Also, I am the chair for women in science and engineering in Canada. And uh, my program is called Vice Planet. If anybody wants to have a look and see uh, what do I do on that capacity. I also wanted to start the talk with many thanks to my collaborators. Some of the immediate ones uh, are uh, written uh, here, but there have been many, many other people who I have collaborated with. And so I would like to say, acknowledge all the work they have done. So we are at a very interesting time in the, uh, in the world. We have um, scale, uh, massive scales for the number of transistors that we have. Here on the right, you can see the largest GPU. Uh, this picture is from two years ago, I think. So at that time, we had 54.2 billion transistors in the largest GPU, but over uh, 2 trillion transistors for the Celebras uh, uh, wafer scale uh, integrated circuit. And so you can see that we have gone from a few uh, thousands of transistors in the 1970s now to trillions of transistors. And on the other hand, uh, the, the sizes of the transistors have uh, become much, much smaller. This is a picture of a three nanometer transistor. And uh, we, uh, we saw one of the talks coming up was going to be about quantum computing, which is also a very different piece. So this means that we have these massive challenges uh, on our way. But it also, with every one of these challenges, this also comes as an opportunity. So I have here a picture uh, from uh, BIS that talks about the cost for manufacturing uh, different circuits. And you can see that as the circuit size, the transistor sizes become smaller, the, um, the cost for them to manufacture them becomes more and more. 
Um, and if we break down this cost, we can see that the cost of the, uh, the software is the one that has increased the most amount. So basically what this means is that there is a bright future for all of you EDA designers who are making uh, placement routing algorithms and other uh, techniques to basically solve these problems. Um, and uh, this is really good for me and my students, but I also want to say that uh, we are also need to think about the types of problems we are trying to solve and see if we can some of these expertise we have solving the problems we have right now to solve the problems of future. So I just want to quickly talk about there's two, ty uh, two types of problems we generally encounter in the world. Um, the first type is called the kind problems. So the kind problems are the problems that are clearly defined. Uh, they're highly constrained. They have a limited number of choices. They have certain rules and the rules do not change. And the rules are clearly communicated. Um, there's relevant information about um, that exists and everybody knows what they are. And it is clear when these problems are solved. So, for example, chess is a kind problem. It is not that it is easy, it is a very hard problem, but it is a problem that is clearly formulated. Each piece can uh, has to follow certain rules. Those rules do not change as the team works out. And then we know exactly what happens when the game has ended. So the, everybody can sacrifice their lives for the king to survive. And so that's basically if the king is in danger and cannot survive, then we the game is over for one group and the other group has won. Uh, but it is over for both of them. And what I would like to argue is that many of our physical design problems are actually uh, in the kind problem. They're very hard problems, but we do know uh, how to, that we don't know, know the rules that they have, that has to be followed to solve them. And also we do know when they are solved. So, so this is again, back to the picture of these uh, massive problems. Again, they are very big, very hard to solve, but they are solvable. So, so, uh, so they, they have a limited number of solutions that we can have. The rules do not change. Suddenly you don't come and say, oh, no, the, this rule you were saying, edge spacing, you don't really need it anymore. But there is some rules that you, you do know. Now, the other type of the problems are called the wicked problems. And basically, wicked problems have no formulation. Um, there is no stopping rule for them. Uh, there is no one solution that can solve that immediate problem. Uh, there is no algorithm, step-by-step -step things. We have to figure out how to solve these problems. And then the problem is also every wicked problem is connected to another wicked problem. So once we solve one part of a wicked problem, another wicked problem might have some extra problems in it. And then also, sometimes when we try to solve these problems, our actions and what we do have immediate consequences on us. The same with our inactions. If we don't try to solve these problems, they, uh, they will have immediate uh, consequences for us. So I put the picture of everything everywhere all at once, and this is a lot of our wicked problems are sort of feel like this, that we have every possible problem all at once. And uh, another example of uh, these wicked problems are the sustainable development uh, goals. So th this could be, it, we can pick any one of these and figure out that this is a problem that has no real formulation, no end and so on. So for example, we have in the um, uh, sort of uh, infrastructure, climate action, no poverty, uh, quality education and so on. So they're all very much interrelated and none of them have a single solution. And then also the consequences for us are very dire. <clears throat> so, excuse me. So uh, here I'm showing some of the uh, pictures that are just related to the climate crisis. We have wildfires, we have droughts, uh, we have deforestations, um, the floods. Uh, the picture of the floods is from um, Pakistan. One third of the country at one point was underwater and then the hurricanes and so on. 
And so, um, so these are wicked problems we are facing today. Uh, we don't know how we can stop them and we don't know how, uh, if we solve one of them, what are the consequences on us as a, as a, as a human race, but also as on other uh, animals and uh, plants that live in the, uh, in the, on the earth. So I would like to argue that we have three major wicked problems. Uh, we have uh, one is a climate change. The other one is the AI and digital technology that's changing things. And the last one is biotechnology um, and how or, or changes in our in the biology. So, for example, with super resistance uh, um, uh, um, germs that don't uh, sort of get solved with antibiotics and so on. So what I would like to really emphasize in my talk is how can we use our physical design knowledge to solve some of these uh, wicked problems or at least solve parts of them. So my first problem, the first wicked problem I would like to talk about is a uh, placement. Now, in placement, we try to uh, find uh, locations for different modules inside the circuit. We have the input, um, and then we usually do a global placement, um, and then we, uh, which basically means there are some of the rules of the placement that are um, and that are not followed. But after that, we legalize that solution, and then we go to detailed placement, and then we finally we have the output for the placement. Um, the requirements for a successful solution is to have a good and simple model. Uh, we need to have powerful optimization techniques, good heuristics, and then also the ability to scale up this solution. And, and we do have all of these. Um, to some extent, they're not, again, easy, but they are things that we have developed using uh, all the hard work that the students, the faculty members are doing, and also researchers in the field. So I just wanted to show you that these problems also don't look alike. Uh, so here are some of the problems, the placement uh, solutions for the ISPD28 benchmarks. As you can see, some of them are much more congested than others. Uh, some of them have these big blocks there. Some of them have uh, clock and wiring networks that really needed to be taken care of. And then we go one year forward, and then we also have another set of circuits here. These are also smaller problems that we look at in academia, in industry. Then again, we will have many, many different types of circuits. Now, some of the challenges we see in the in placement is uh, there is a modern technology constraints. Uh, there can be fence region constraints. So parts of the circuit has to have different voltages. So we put a fence around them. And also we need to consider detailed routing for the placement. So, uh, so our kind problem is to find efficient solutions for placement fast. And uh, I would like to talk a little bit about how we did this. Um, so the first part of the problem is uh, using a primal and dual based placement. This was first in the, introduced by Sim, uh, SimPL. Um, so basically you take two different approaches for optimization goals to the problem. The top approach, which you can see the picture, this was supposed to be a video, but unfortunately video did not come up in the presentation. But the first one is that we wanna to try to minimize the wire length. So at the beginning, the wire length are all, the, the cells are all close to each other. And then in the second problem that we are trying to solve is to maximize the whitest space. And at this, these two problems are start far away. And as every iteration, we get them closer to and closer to each other. But this is a this is a problem that we can actually define objectives for it. So the objective is reduce wire length, reduce whitest space. We can clearly um, measure these objectives. We know when we have we can stop these placement problems, and then also at every point we know exactly what is the um, uh, what are the rules that we need to follow to have a placement that is acceptable. Uh, so this work was done by um, 
Um, this the initial work for a placer was done by Karen Poor and Kennings and myself, and so so we 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 got some really good initial results from this. But one of the things we found is that even very good solutions that we had when uh, in placement, when we send them to the routing, they actually came up as. Um, really, really uh, problematic, could come up as really, really problematic because in the routing, we might have things like a narrow channel or very congested areas, which means that we will not be able to route that part of the circuit. So then we had a detailed routing based placement. This was a work by uh, Fakhir Tabrizi and Almeida, Meinhard and Bustani. And then we're working on trying to use machine learning to uh, find uh, where these uh, detailed routing problems can happen and fix those. So for example, you give a place circuit um, to a router, you also collect some data, You the router uh, routes the circuit, finds the violations. Um, from the collection data, we also have the features on the bottom path, and then we have the violations and those features give it to the learning model, and then we come with the predictions. Then we will use those predictions to actually improve the placement. And uh, from there, we will have much, much better results in our placement. Um, the second part of it was when uh, we're doing um, a placement, um, we we have different techniques for legalizing this placement. And the legalization, as you can see on the top, uh, the after global placement, we might have um, cells just shown by blue here that might have overlap with one another or might not be on rows. So we have to basically legalize this. We have many different algorithms for legalization and they come up with different solutions. But a lot of the times these solutions depend on the type of the circuit that we have. So some circuits will do much, much better with some type of legalization. So for example, if the circuit is very congested, it might come up with, um, in certain areas, it might a uh, legalization technique that actually spreads itself a lot more widely might be better. If there is a circuit with, um, with uh, like, blockages in the middle, then might be that if you put certain cer uh, uh, certain um, modules together, that might be better because they can avoid those, um, uh, those blocked areas. So this work is with Neto, Neto and uh, Gunzel. And what we did in this case is we took the layout um, data, we took the different uh, legalizations and used the CNN model again to find out what legalization algorithm is the best fit for the circuit. So these were some of the um, some of the placement problems, but I actually wanted to show you a wicked placement problem. And uh, this is oops, I don't think this is going to work. But this is a video um, that uh, we found out, and there's this in this video. There's a map of the city of Calgary, and there is these red dots that come on and off, and each red dot is basically a um, a child ending up in a hospital because of a asthma attack that was so bad that the child had to go to the hospital. And we can see in the video, uh, I'll put the video online if anybody wants to see it later on, but we can see in this video that there are certain parts of the city that are much worse. So here I have drawn the picture of the, um, that, uh, the city uh, and these red dots that you can see, some of them are less, um, less shown because those are the kids who were in the hospital a few days before and haven't come out of the hospital. And let's see. Okay, sorry, the pictures are not coming up, but we actually made this map overlaid it with the sources of pollution, including the big roads. If you see here, the yellow ones are the big roads. Um, the, 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 the rectangle, which is yet red here, in the um, in the top uh, right corner is actually closeness to the airport. Some of these areas on the top right are actually really close to um, sort of uh, industrial and uh, agricultural 
um, pollutant. And the parts here that we have more children, again, these are the university power plant and also the, the hospital, the main hospital in the city that burns the, um, the, the whatever the waste of the hospital. And that is another source of pollution. And so basically the question is, um, well, in a very personal le level, the question can be, what do we do to um, like, you know, how do I buy a house where my children might have less asthma? But on the other place is that um, how do we actually, what do we do? How do we place things that clean the air close to these facilities so that they can actually become uh, less polluted? So again, uh, we start with a very wicked problem, with, with a problem of uh, uh, like uh, formulation, but we can't really formulate this problem really easily. There is no stopping rule because we don't know when chil children would not have to have asthma. Is, and is air pollution the only cause of it? There is no one solution or no immediate solution. And there's no algorithms to solve this. It's not that easy. And what we need to do is we need to basically um, try to figure out how to solve this problem and not cause other problems for other things. Uh, so for example, if we have too many trees in one part, maybe the, the density of housing can uh, cannot be as much as the, there is need for, and then the housing prices would skyrocket. Um, and then finally, whatever we try to attempt to solve the problems, the consequences, we, uh, we have those consequences because we live in this city too. Okay, the second problem is I want to focus on is a clustering problem. And the clustering problem um, comes from the, the huge sizes of the transistors we can see. So here we have up to 50 billion transistors uh, for uh, circuits, but we also see we have gone up to um, 2 trillion. And uh, what we are trying to do right now is to try to solve these, uh, these problems with uh, uh, these these massive problems um, with sort of uh, trying to figure out how to solve these problems. And one of the techniques we have used before is uh, clustering. Now, clustering is a kind problem because we have a formulation. We say we want to put cells that are most connected to one another close to each other. It is highly constrained because we have the graph that describes the network. Uh, we will have limited number of choices. This limit is very high, but we still have a limited number of choices. We clearly define rules and all the relevant information we know, and we know where we want to stop, like the sizes can become uh, manageable for the designers. And then um, if I don't do a really, really good job on clustering. I am personally not going to be affected. Maybe if I do that consistently, I will lose my job. But personally, it doesn't affect the solution to this problem doesn't affect me or the people close to me. So there are many, many different techniques to solve uh, clustering. So best choice was uh, came out of uh, um, IBM group, uh, HMEDIS, which uh, came out uh, in the late 1990s, and they use different types of clustering uh, to use it later on for partitioning. Uh, but I want to talk about one type of clustering that uh, my group came up with, and this is called, um, this is based on the uh, algebraic multigrid. Algebraic multigrids are actually used for solving the systems of equations. So if you have a system of equation of AX is equal to B, uh, you try to sort of guess what this X is uh, and uh, find out with, uh, what is the error between B and A times X. And then you reduce the size of this A matrix a smaller and a smaller till you get to a very, very small size that you can actually sort of find the error you basically make that error go to zero and then you open up that circuit. So it is sort of like clustering, but for a very, very big matrix. So by looking at algebraic multigrid, um, which is normally so used for solving um, uh, these large systems of equations, 
Uh, my group and I thought that this is very close to what uh, happens in clustering a circuit. So I'm showing a circuit up here. Uh, you can see the number, the, the, the cells and the, the numbers on the edges show the connectivity. So we have like cell two is connected to one, three, and four, and so on. Using this algebraic multigrid, if we put this circuit as a uh, matrix, show this as a connectivity matrix, then we can actually use algebraic multigrid to reduce the circuit. And it gives us a, a clustering of where uh, sort of the sizes are sort of equal and the cells with the highest connectivity are connected to each other. The other good thing here is that I'm not showing as much is that once you do this clustering, it also tells you that some clusters, for example, six here, can be connected into two clusters. It can go with five or it can go with seven, eight, nine. And it also tells me that seven is a much more important node than eight or nine, the same with two and five. They, these are called the coarse points and the other points are fine points. Now, this, uh, this is really important, again, because a lot of the times when we do clustering, we make decisions at the top level where there is too many decisions to be made. And by reducing, by taking out that decision making at the top level, we can actually make sure that we make better decisions right at the bottom levels. But also we figure out those nodes with the highest connectivity. Now, this is again, though, we have a, uh, a circuit, we have the network, we have the connectivity matrix, we have all the mathematical formulation we need to be able to solve this problem. How does this become wicked? Um, well, we can have a look at the information and misinformation that exists. Uh, this is a survey my group did about uh, climate and, uh, and what our people think about it. Uh, the climate and one of the questions which I thought like nobody will answer as a misinformation was is climate crisis a hoax and uh, unfortunately about 20 percent of the people who live in my region still think that climate crisis is a hoax or is not uh, has man-made causes now a lot of these people about 30 percent of them said that their source for thinking like this is a peer-reviewed paper and uh, so we went and dig deeper into this, uh, this, these sources and see where these sources come from. And one of the things we found is that they come from bots. Um, so, so uh, like a group uh, can put up a bot and or a, a bot farm, and these bots start to sort of um, share this information between them. Now, as long as this ecosystem stays between the bots, that's fine. But then if there is one person who is either misinformed or sees this information and thinks that this resonates with them, even though this paper has got no uh, credential, hasn't been uh, produced anywhere else or the results are not true, that if one person starts to, uh, to take this out of the bot ecosystem, it will start to go to other people and this misinformation can spread really quickly. And so one of the things we are trying to do is we are trying to look at these sort of a nodes inside the graph of connectivity between all the people and figured out where these misinformations start. What are those uh, points that the course points such as like in the ANG and who are these connectivities are together so we can actually better understand the sources of misinformation and um, and sort of stop those types of misinformation from spreading. So the last problem I'm quickly going to talk about is the uh, the routing problem. And uh, so the routing problem is uh, you basically, once you have uh, put all the circuit together, you uh, look at the, the you, you sort of find out how different nets could be connected to each other. And then you basically look at the rough routing for the whole circuit. Once you have done that, then you go and see for each one of these nets using the solution from the global routing, look at how uh, exactly 
which uh, layer this uh, rod should be, where the pins should be, and, and so on. And so that's called the detailed routing. And I'm again, apologize for the video not showing. But uh, some of the challenges that we have in routing are could be things like complicated pin access problems or blockages, narrow channels. And there are several other challenges, but these are some of the main ones. So the again, the problem that we have for routing is can we find a routable solution fast? And uh, the, one of the methods we use for this is reinforcement learning for routing. And this was done by Gandhi, Taylor, and Bussani and myself. So the idea was we take the initial global routing and uh, we look at the rip up and reroutes um, and the violations causing, the, uh, like we rip up some nets and reroute it and then say, okay, was that not violation that was caused by this net is fixed. If it is not fixed, then we'll just sort of go back and repop and reroute. If it is true, then we go to, um, and, and there's no more violation, nets with no violations is left, then we go to detail routing. So basically, we want to use reinforcement learning to learn how to rip up and reroute nets. And I have a little example of this for you. So we, we say that the routing can be done in two stages. The first part is the router and then the ripper, which is basically goes on and cleaning up all the mess that the router has made. So if we have a uh, router has routed these three nets, so the yellow one, the orange one, and the blue one, and we can see that there is a violation on the, um, on the, um, no, uh, square 12, which is shown with red here. And so the ripper finds this and uh, sort of rips one of these two nets. In this case, it's ripped the blue net. So this is one of the things that the ripper has to learn. Should I rip the orange net or should I rip the blue net? Um, so, so it learns that and then it reroutes that. So our RL Ripper is a sort of a, a, uh, uses the initial routing. Once the initial routing is done, uh, then it goes down into, uh, into sorting and feature extractions. And then it repops and reroutes and calculates the new violations. And then and analyzes the actions it has done. So calculates the rewards, uh, finds out if it is true or to rip or not rip. And then finally, it checks the episode to see if it is we have had enough uh, routing or not. And this is uh, one of the newest paper we had published just recently in a GLS VLSI. So the results for this was that uh, the RL Ripper actually did learn how to to uh, to uh, to rip and also reduce the number of violations in the detailed routing technique. Now, what is our wicked routing problem in the uh, the global stage? And uh, this is a problem I was trying to solve with one of my students. This student actually was herself a refugee. And she had a passion uh, to help the refugees who are coming from different parts of the world. So the map here shows the Sinhar region of uh, northern Iraq and northern Syria. And uh, this is where many of the Kurdish refugees were trying to flee once the uh, ISIS was attacking them. So the question we were trying to find is, can we actually learn uh, how to, uh, using routing algorithms, to bring necessities to these refugees? So we wanted to reduce the, um, the, the, the distance, but we also wanted to uh, make sure that we give them the most amount of uh, help. And uh, so can we use reinforcement routing algorithms to, 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 for this case? And one of the things we found is that this problem, again, was a very wicked problem. There was no formulation at the beginning of what constitute helps to refugees, like do they need water, do they need food, do they need shoes, and so on. Uh, there was no stopping criteria, like did we just, if we dropped the aid, would they get it, would they not get it? And um, also every problem was related to another problem. So how did we actually make sure the technology that we were developing was not used for something 
uh, worse, or that the, the help that we were giving was actually was used by the, the ISIS soldiers. And then also the people who were attempting to solve the problem could face the consequences of these problems. And so, so this is one of the ongoing works that we are still working on. And uh, we have got some really good simulation results on this, on how to actually uh, make sure that the results are gone to people who need it. And also the, the, the routing paths are so that uh, it is it puts the, the people who are trying the drones or whatever is dropping the aid or aiding the people into least amount of danger. Okay, I would like to uh, finish by saying that um, I talked about many different problems, um, but the only way for us to make sure that all of these problems are solved is to uh, to make those few, those solutions that we have. Now, I know that I called them wicked and I said that they're very hard to solve. But I think with all the power we have and expertise we have uh, in electronic design automation, all the great work we have done um, into the um, in uh, in this area, we will actually be able to make a future that is much much better for the whole humanity. And uh, just really quickly is that uh, this is the the wicked sustainability problem i just wanted to finish this with this uh um with this uh quote that under the smoke in front of the roaring wave of the bushfire i thought of the smaller lives that were caught thank you thank you dr lali beja for the so nice talk so while I uh, wait for questions from the from the audience in the chat, uh, I would like to state some questions myself. So Please. my my first question is kind of a relation between uh, well, actually, the about the use of machine learning techniques on both uh, the uh, the EDA area and and those wicked problems um, in. In the EDA area, uh, when applying the machine learning techniques, we have facing the problem of how to access a huge amount of data that could, that could be used to train our models. How would this kind of problem uh, impact in the, in the case of trying to solve some uh, wicked problems? Yeah, so very good question. So some wicked problems have a lot of data. We have a lot of data on them. So for example, we have quite a few data sets in Twitter, from Twitter tweets and with bots. There are uh, millions and millions of them. And, uh, and they're readily accessible. So much, much easier to get to than they are in the, um, than they are in the, um, what's it called, in, in circuits. Yeah. Uh, there are other problems that we have not no answer to. So, for example, the refugee problems are really hard. We actually uh, managed to interview between 20 to 40 refugees to get the data, but that was very, very time consuming. And we couldn't find any more refugees to, you know, to interview, but the interviews were also, uh, wasn't done by anybody from engineering. We had social scientists who knew what they were doing and social workers who were present to help with these interviews. And, uh, and we couldn't do a survey with uh, consciously. So what my answer is, is that there's different types of machine learning. So that's why we use like, you know, larger scale uh, unsupervised machine learning when we wanted to do with, deal with the information misinformation because we have so much data um, and unsupervised clustering might actually help us to reduce the size to understand the connections, like see, see the, the big node, big picture of uh, what are the big actors and then try to sort of the smaller things we can sort of uh, put them in the clusters and so on. Uh, with the problems where we don't have a data, then we we need to use uh, different types of modeling and simulations. So um, so and then also reinforcement learning might be much much better and closer to human behavior in that case. 
thank you. Um, well, um, I have another question. Yeah. <laughs> um, have have you have you in investigated the possibility of uh, combining two solutions coming from physical design automation to uh, to uh, any kind of wicked uh, wicked problem? For example. Uh, suppose that you have to, at the same time, identify the most uh, dangerous areas of, of Calgary, let's say, uh, and also to find the, the routes for the hospitals in case of uh, any disaster or something like this. Uh, have you ever thought about this? <laughs> Would be the sequential, the, the, the sequential steps in the uh, placement of routing or something like this. Uh, actually, it's kind of different, actually, but yeah. Yeah, this is um, this is actually one of the things we are working on right now. Um, so, with the regards to the asthma data uh, and uh, equity in transportation, so so that we I showed you in the like I, I'm sorry the pictures didn't come out really well, but the picture uh, the, the a lot of the kids with the asthma also live close to the airport in Calgary, and this is not just Calgary. London Heathrow had this very similar answers. So the next part that we are right now working on is to find out how long does it take for each one of those parents to take their kid to the hospital and using what mode. And then we also have the census data of are these, like, you know, there are parts of the city that people have cars and there are parts of the city that people don't have cars or households that have less probability of having cars and personal cars. Um, and uh, how do you get to the hospital? So, so and then that will go back into the uh, using EDA for routing, finding the fastest way. Um, but also at the same time is the, the question is that how equitable our our uh, our city is made, you know. So, so that some people have higher risk, but also much, much more uh, time. They, it takes them a lot longer time to get to the hospital because the hospitals are actually far away from the, the, the location they're in. So yes, we have, but if there is any other ideas like this, that would be fantastic to, to think about and uh, see how we can work on that. Yeah, it's, it is a much tough problem because uh, the variables are much bigger, no? If yeah. there is a wind, the wind changes the direction, the problem changes again. At least in integrated circuit, our uh, parameters are more stable. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. And, and that's why we need to sort of make sure that uh, uh, us as experts also think about those problems because, uh, you know, and, and work with people who are in the... Okay, do we have time for a, maybe a last question, Ricardo? Yes, we have time, but yeah, because we uh, I don't I don't see any question coming from the chat, yeah. but I have uh, I have something that would be maybe a final question from my side because I was thinking about uh, um, that our in our, uh, along our our professional um, life we we have seen so many um, problems. Uh, coming again with uh, different specifications and probably more um, more stringent specifications and with higher uh, with hi with higher complexity and uh, in this sense uh, how would be your suggestion for the students who are uh, who are attending us this this talk uh, about what kind of what kind of um, general uh, problems and, and associated computational solutions that would be important to, to understand and to, and to study very deep so as to be able to apply them in, in different domains of applications during the next 10 or 20 years. So, kind of so philosophical question, right? Yeah, that was a wicked question. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no. Uh, well, so for a PhD student, I think that the PhD students are and should be um, studying deeply one topic. 
But I also, my suggestion to everybody, if PhD or not, is that you actually also go to something that is not exactly related to your topic. So when I had first started my uh, as, as a professor in Calgary, I actually every year I would spend three or four days go to a math conference. And to be honest, I didn't understand more than like half an hour of the whole sessions. But I will go to every session. I will stand understand what the problem they were trying to solve is, listen to the talk, like, you know, get lost in the talk. But then I knew which are the papers I need to read and what is this, how can I do this? And so from there, I learned about how to solve multi-objective optimization problems, geometric optimization problems, robust optimization, stochastic optimization. And I had all of those directly included in my work. The same thing with the AMG that I was talking about. It was work I did with uh, some people from power systems that they're using to solve a larger scale grids. And I like, oh, this looks really interesting. So I think it is really important to go deep into one topic as long as you don't for forget the range that you need to also acquire the, to solve these other problems or bring a new perspective to them. So I suggest to, to look at those things and, um, and uh, to look at other things. You don't need to know them very deeply. Uh, you need to know as much as you can. And then also try to collaborate with people. None of the work I have ever done uh, has been done just by me or my group only. It's the best work has been when, I, uh, when it was done with someone else. I hope I, didn't, I answered your question. You are muted, Jose. Sorry. Uh, actually, we have another question, but now coming from the chat, so I'm going to read the... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Ricardo. Ricardo just posted the, the question. So, uh, yeah. So it comes from Elias Ramos. Uh, he, talk, he said, uh, excellent talk. Do you believe in machine learning for solving problems in EDA, even with many of your algorithms needing a theoretical basis not yet demonstrated. Uh, I, I, well, okay. I'm not sure I understand the, understood the theoretical basis not yet demonstrated, but I think he's, uh, uh, he's referring to the, to the wicked problems, not exactly to the EDA problems maybe. Because in the eight problems, uh, the, the, the theoretical basis has already been demonstrated. Right. Yeah, but, or maybe it is about machine learning that we don't understand oh, yeah. exactly what it does. Yeah. Uh, that is one of the problems with machine learning. Is, is that, Elias, if that's correct, please let us know. If not, please uh, let us know what the, the question is. But um, one of the problems with machine learning is it's such a black box. Like we don't really understand what it is doing uh, compared to optimization techniques, for example, that I, I used as well, that in optimization techniques, uh, we don't have a black box. We know exactly what is happening and, and so on, or mo most of the times we do. Um, and I think the reason that those uh, algorithms might actually be useful in machine learning, some of the machine learning algorithms can be useful goes back to places where we don't have a really good model. So if you have a very good model and we know how to solve this model, we might as well use the optimization techniques or heuristics that solve the problem. Uh, if we don't have a model, we don't really know what we want to solve. Some of these machine learnings might be better. Is easier to solve. I. Uh, um, Elias, please let me know if I answered your questions. Yeah. Uh, he's not posted yeah. anything more, but uh, I guess yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, if we don't... Yeah, he, he's... Yeah, he's he's thanking thanking you yeah. for the answer. I think his uh, it has addressed your answer has addressed his his doubt. Okay, well, uh, with that said, I think we can uh, finish the 
the session for today. Uh, I would like to give the the, the word to, to Ricardo again and thank you for the for the invitation also. Uh, so thank you again, Lani, for the very nice talk. Uh, 